night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley He will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall. It has been paid for Jesus led and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hope my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. Children's Church is now dismissed. <laughs> Words of mine, in your heart and in your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house, and when you're walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Thank you so much, Annabelle. I really appreciate you reading the scripture for us here this morning. Well, thank you everyone for joining us here. Um, I know Laura just prayed. Let's, I'm, I'm going to lead us in prayer as well. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the people gathered here, uh, your people, Lord, your congregation here at Waxhaw Baptist Church. I want to lift each and every person here up to you as we delve into your word. I pray for churches around the world, Lord, as our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world uh, come together today to worship you to hear your word preached and uh, have the gospel proclaimed and pray for them as well. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our text, uh, Mike cut out there at the beginning, is from Deuteronomy um, chapter 11, verses 18 through 19 is our primary text this morning. Now to get the context of what's going on with Deuteronomy, uh, if you read the first five books of the Bible, you get to Deuteronomy, you realize when you read the beginning, it is largely a speech by Moses where he is recounting the law and the works of the Lord and some of the history that the people of Israel have been through. So this is a really long speech by Moses where he is rehashing some of the things we've heard before in some of the other books. There are some additional things. But these are the things that he believes are important for the people to hear. This is a group of people who have been slaves in Egypt. They didn't really have much of an identity, it seems, in Egypt, other than they were slaves. Um, They were enslaved people in Egypt. They're coming out of Egypt to start a new nation. And with that, they're going to have new laws, new customs, uh, and a new relationship with God. So as he is sharing this, we come to verse 18 in chapter 11. I'm in chapter 4. Let's get to chapter 11. As Annabelle read, you shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So what words of mine is he talking about there? If you go and look back and you read up until this point, you see that this is God speaking to his people. These are God's words that are being laid up in the people's heart. And it's important that it's not their ideas that are there that are being stored up in their heart and passed down, but it's God's ideas. We're about in just a moment to talk about children and the importance of passing down the faith. If you, are, if you don't have children, if your children are closer to Social Security than diapers, don't check out. If you don't have children, also don't check out because there's something here for you as well. So we have the people he's speaking to. Who are these people? Um, at this point, they're, he's going to die at the end of the speech, and they're going to go in the promised land. These were actually children that left Egypt. As you'll recall, the Israelites left Egypt. They were going to go to the promised land, got to the edge, and then chickened out and didn't have faith in God. And therefore, God sentenced them to wander for 40 years in the desert until that generation that had been unfaithful had died out. So these are their children about to go into the land, and they are being admonished to share the word of God with their children. It says that these shall be bound on them as a sign on your hand, as a frontlet between the eyes. There's some people that have taken that literally and have bound the law to their hands and to their head. But throughout Scripture, you see the right hand as a symbol of the eminence of the strength and of the focus you know the right hand of the lord Um, you have the blessing on the right hand and the curse on the left so you have the word of god bound to the right hand and his frontlets between the eyes so everywhere you go you have the word of the lord impressed upon you and you'll see echoes of this even in revelation where the uh, there's people with the seal of god on their head Um, you see where people are sealed or marked uh, for god on their foreheads So the same idea is in play here. Now this is verse 19. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. And this is where we're really going to delve into the importance of passing on faith, the faith to the next generation. Um, When I was a student at Chapel Hill, there was an evangelist who would go around and preach at college campuses. Now, there were some that were, frankly, kind of wacky. This guy was not one of those. Um, he was preaching, and he did apologetics. So he's dealing with a lot of secular people who did not believe in Jesus Christ. And they'd have philosophical arguments and historical arguments, and, and he would, through it all, have the gospel coming through. But there was a student uh, who was engaging in the debate with this gentleman, 
And the student raised the objection that the only reason that the evangelist was presenting the Christian faith and wasn't presenting uh, Hinduism or Islam or Buddhism or anything else was because he was raised in a Christian home and he'd been taught that. If he had been raised in Indonesia, he probably wouldn't be a Christian. He would be vigorously defending his faith there. If he was raised in Saudi Arabia, he would most likely be Muslim and would be uh, presenting that faith there. So the argument was, is you're just a product of the parents and the culture that you happen to be raised in, and you just as easily could have been any other religion as you could be a Christian. And that has no bearing on the truth of the gospel, or whether it's true or false, obviously. So it kind of missed the point. But it did raise a very important point, which the student was not trying to make, and that is the importance of family formation in Christianity. A lot of times we like to idolize, I shouldn't say idolize, but we kind of do, Billy Graham, oh my goodness, Billy Graham. Uh, yeah, and I'm not picking on Billy Graham, to be clear. Or, oh, there's this other evangelist, and they're so gifted. And we have this focus on and passion preaching, which can be great. We have a focus on uh, evangelistic presentations, which can be great. But the simple truth of it is I'd be willing, if I were a gambling man, but I'm not, I'd be willing to wager that most Christians became Christians because they were raised in a family of Christians. It's not very, it's kind of boring, right? That's kind of a boring story. You know, people share their testimony. What was your testimony? You know, and some people get up and say, well, I was, you know, living horribly and did all these horrible things. And then, you know, Christ appeared and light shone in my prison cell and I became a Christian. Most people, it's not like that. Most of the time, it is the boring day-to-day -day faith through the ups and downs of everyday life that people learn the faith and how to follow Christ. And... The scripture actually leans into that. It doesn't say, it's, uh, it says, take them to Sunday school. No, it actually doesn't say take them to Sunday school. I'm sorry. And I'm not picking on Sunday school. Um, that was, it's kind of a new idea, maybe a couple hundred years old, kind of a newfangled invention. Um, so we don't have, take them to youth necessarily in here. It doesn't say anything else about that. But it does say, uh, what does it say? It says, you'll teach them to your children, talk to them when you're sitting in your house. Okay, when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. And just to be clear, I am not picking on youth or Sunday school or any other program that can be helpful in assisting the family in teaching the children. What I am saying is that the primary responsibility of parents and grandparents, where y'all aren't getting off the hook, is to teach the faith to the children. And it says in these different scenarios, when you're walking by the way, I don't think it necessarily has to be a structured time that, you know, this is when we are going to teach this, and that can be good. But if you're walking in nature with your children, and you look at the sunset, and you say, isn't that incredible that God made that sun and has given us such beauty for us to see? And you can talk about God's creation and how he created the world. Or when you're sitting in your house and you have a thought that you want to share with your children. Hey, this story that we just read reminds me of in the Bible where, and you go from there. Or when you're lying down at night and you're praying with your children. Thank you, God, for helping us make it through the day. Watch over us while we sleep. We trust you. Or when you rise, thank you, God, that I'm alive today, that you're giving me breath. Be with me and guide me in the day. These times where you're living it alongside your family is where the faith is truly conveyed. But in order to convey it, we have to have it in our own hearts. And that's a challenge sometimes. What if our children ask us a question we don't know the answer to about God? Sometimes it might be that we just don't know the answer to that question and we need to delve into his word or we need to learn about it. Or sometimes we need to have the humility to say, I have no idea. God, children will think of amazing questions about God that you will have no idea what the answer to. And you can tell them, I don't think anyone else has an answer to that either. And have that humility to show them that. 
So even when you don't know, it can be a teaching moment. When you have, uh, God gave his people Israel several different ways of teaching and learning the word. So the priests were instructed in carrying out the word. The king had a role in doing justice and following the word of the Lord. Uh, we don't have a king anymore, uh, or we're not in the kingdom of Israel anyway. Um, and we don't have a priestly system anymore. So those have fallen away from the structure that we have this, this faith conveyed. But the parents still have a primary responsibility in conveying the faith. As far as um, what that looks like, specifically with children um, in real life, they know when you're tired, when you're distracted, when you're annoyed. It's easy to come into church and put on a face that, you know, oh, we are holy and we will, you know, we teach the word and we abide by it. But in real life, when you're exhausted or you have frustrations in your marriage or you have a health problem or you have any challenge that any one of us could have in our life, that truth, children are going to pick up on that. And if you're telling them one thing and doing something different, they will know. They might not be able to articulate it, but they will know. So we have to gauge our own selves and our uh, faithfulness to the Word because you don't want it to be one of those do as I say but not as I do kind of situations. If you think about children learning the faith, and I, I use that phrase, learning how to live in the way, the way of Jesus, um, we can't expect them to just pick it up on their own. Could you imagine if you just handed a child a trigonometry textbook and said, good luck, kid, you'll get it, and then be shocked and disappointed later when they don't turn out to know trigonometry very well? Would that be very fair to them? It would not be fair to them. Um, you know, you have to walk along in the way with them and teach them and not just hand them the, you know, hand them a study Bible and say, you know, you can read this when you feel like it or uh, maybe they'll teach you some stuff there at Sunday school. No, you have to be actively engaged, and you can't be shocked later if you don't put in that time and effort when they don't turn out the way that you had hoped. And different families may do different things. Uh, when I was growing up, my mother would read the Bible to me every night as we would go to bed. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe other families wake up and read the Bible, right? I think sometimes we lean in so hard on the prescribed way of doing things that we miss the point of just doing them. As far as grandparents, I told you you were not going to get off the hook. So we are going to uh, talk to you here in just a moment. Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 through 10. It says... Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, and on the day that you stood before the Lord, how on the day that you stood before the Lord, your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words." so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. So grandparents, not just your children, and I think you sometimes hear that mentality, like, oh, I did my job, I'm done, I raised my kids, it's their problem now. Maybe don't be so quick to think that that's the truth. You still have responsibility and role, a role there. And there's some situations where grandparents are raising grandchildren and are acting as a parent. And... You know, the Lord blessed them for doing that, for uh, entering in that phase of life again and uh, keeping the family going. So there is a responsibility not just to teach your own children, but to make sure it passes to the next generation. I know we've seen in some families, sometimes you'll see where, you know, you have the strong Christian influence here, and then there's a generation where it doesn't seem to have taken root. And then you see the next generation coming up. And the concern would be, is it going to end with uh, that last generation of strong believers, or is it going, even if it skips a generation, is it going to continue? Because, you know, if, if there's a generation that does not know the Lord, how will it be taught? The Scripture will be there, 
but having to learn from the beginning without someone to guide you be incredibly difficult. And also, grandparents, not only do you have a duty to teach your children's children, but your children are still your children. It doesn't say, like, until they turn 18 or 21 or 25, and then you can stop teaching them. Um, what you are teaching them will change. How you communicate with a five-year-old who is going through five-year-old problems in life and learning the very basics of, of Christianity and following the Lord, it's going to be very different from the 35-year-old or the 25-year-old who is you know, going through the loss of a child or uh, you know, their marriage is falling apart. There's different roles there for you as a parent. But just because your children are older and they are out of the house doesn't mean that you don't serve as an advisor and a counselor and someone to strengthen them in those hard times and to give them counsel as needed. As far as the the day-to-day what that looks like, it's going to vary from family to family. As I said, some grandparents are raising their grandchildren, and that's going to be very direct. In other cases, they may live across the country, and you have very limited interaction with grandchildren. But you have to, in your own situation, do what you can do to be that beacon of faith and light for that grandchild. As far or with with uh, families, multi generational families coming together. If you're having a meal together, having that prayer, that constant um, acknowledgement of God's provision for you, of feeding you and your family, little things like that, I believe, go a long way to teaching uh, Christian practice. <clears throat> There's a quote from, I'm going to quote Charlotte Mason, who's a Christian educational philosopher. Um, I might read it twice. It's a, it's, you have to listen to it. The wonder that Almighty God can endure so far to leave the very making of an immortal being in the hands of human parents is only matched by the wonder that human parents can accept this divine trust with hardly a thought of its significance. I'm going to read that one more time. The wonder that Almighty God can endure so far to leave the very making of an immortal being in the hands of human parents is only matched by the wonder that human parents can accept this divine trust with hardly a thought of its significance. Everyone we come into contact with is an immortal being and will be living eternally somewhere. Every person we interact with, whether they are a friend or an enemy, whether it's a stranger or a family member, they were made to live in eternity with God or apart from Him. The life we get to leave in this temporal world is our limited chance to have an impact on what that eternal world looks like. And we quite thoughtlessly, go through life, bumbling about, not thinking about how our interactions will affect others and the way that they're going to follow the Lord, whether they're going to follow Him or not. And nowhere, again, I hate to, to beat the same drum, nowhere is that more evident than in our daily life with our family where we have to deal with the reality of bills and bumps and scrapes and disappointments and everything that comes with life. That is perhaps where we have the most power in influencing an immortal being, and how they will spend eternity. Not only are we to share the word, the gospel, the way to follow Christ, but we're also to testify as to how God has impacted our lives. If you look in chapter four of Deuteronomy again it says in verse nine lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen so they have heard the word of the Lord but they've also seen what God has done if you stop and think I remember I was referencing that these are the people who were children coming out of Egypt so I'm going to miss some things but let's briefly recount some of the things that they have seen with their own eyes Uh, they saw the plagues of Egypt 
They saw uh, the locust come. The waters turned to blood. They saw uh, darkness. They saw that the Egyptians had darkness in the land. They saw the plague uh, that, that took out the firstborn of all the Egyptians, but they were spared because of the blood over the lamp, uh, excuse me, over the doorpost. They saw with their own eyes these things, the great exodus from Israel with the pursuit of Pharaoh's army, the parting of the Red Sea. They saw the waters part, and they walked through them, and then they saw them close on the Egyptians behind them. They saw the fire that led them by uh, night and the smoke, the pillar of smoke that led them by day. They saw how water was provided in the desert, how manna came from heaven, birds and meat from heaven for the people to eat. They saw the earth open up and swallow people who were um, rebelling against Yahweh and against Moses' leadership. They saw, <coughs> excuse me, they saw that the sandals that they wore on their feet did not wear out through 40 years of wandering. They would have seen all of these things with their own eyes. And they could testify to these things to their children. A lot of times through Scripture you'll see that there'll be miraculous events happen. And then it'll be quiet. If you think about it as far as like supernatural activity that people can see for quite a while. You know, you'll have a prophet come and there'll be amazing things happen. And then the prophet's not there and everything runs amok in the kingdom. Um, and... Having those testimonies of the prior generation to give strength to those who are battling through today's troubles are very vital, I think. Being able to say to someone, I know that God can get you through this because this is what he has gotten me through. Here is how he has made provision for my life. Here is how he has protected me. Here's how he gave me guidance when I didn't know what to do. Here's how this bad thing that happened in my life actually worked to good when I look back on it years later. That testimony is key. And I think it's one of the key things that those who have been through life and faced challenges and saw that the Lord was good and stood by them and cared for them can pass on to the next gener generation. I think about um, how often we accept God's blessing without taking note of it and remembering it. God helps us this week, and by next week we've forgotten and taken it for granted. Recounting this to children, and, and not just children, but other generations and other people, is a way to keep in mind God's faithfulness to his people. There's a, I think this is Soren Kierkegaard. I'm slightly taking this out of context. He said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And that's the challenge that we find ourselves in sometimes as a younger generation. When you have a person who is going through teenage years and the world's falling apart and they don't understand what's going on, having someone that's been through it, maybe not the same challenge, but who survived it and said, look, you're going to come out on the other side of this and it's going to be fine. Having that testimony there is key. They can understand that this is normal in, in that scenario. Life is confusing and falling apart. They don't know how they fit in, what their life is going to be. But when you live through it and you look back, you see the hand of God throughout your life. So the ability not just to share the word of God, um, but to share the gospel and how it is applied in your life, how God has cared for you, how God has watched over you. Could you imagine the stories that this group of Israelites could tell the next generation? I mean, Grandpa, tell me again about how there was fire in the sky and you guys fought. Tell me about how the, you know, the, you, know, you know, the boys would be like, tell us about the army getting crushed under the water, right? That is what can be told and taught by those who were, have been through life. And I had mentioned that there's, I know there's many people who don't have children. Um, perhaps um, God's called you to singleness. Perhaps um, you, for whatever reason, don't have children. You've lost a child or uh, for whatever reason. Does this sermon have any bearing on you and on your life? I think the answer is yes, because it's not simply parents and children, but it is the community at large testifying. 
you know, this is actually just a big lead up to uh, we need helpers in the Sunday school department. That's all that, no, no, I'm just joking. Um, but we do. I'm sure that we would appreciate more help in the Sunday school department. You can contribute just because someone is not your biological or adopted child. You can contribute to passing the faith on in some way, some small way, small or large. The important thing to know is that it is a community of faith. Um, we often, in our American t- context, have an idea of being the Lone Ranger, like we're going to go out and do things ourselves, or I'm going to get it done. I'm going to be the one that, through my grit and determination, is going to... That's not the way that you see it handled in Scripture. If you look through the letter, letters of Paul, and Paul is obviously very strong in the faith, I think we could say, He's always thanking the fellow servants in the letters. Thank you to so-and-so for helping me. Thank you for, you know, keeping the faith. And we see that it was a team approach. And in the same way, a community comes together to bolster each other's faith, not even necessarily down the generation, sometimes up the generations, um, up the age uh, group, to see someone younger stepping in and sharing how God is helping them in their life. It's a mutually supporting group. The church is referred to as a building at some points in Scripture, and there's the cornerstone, which is Christ, and then we build upon that. We build upon that structure. We each have our little stone that we put in. It's not about us individually. It's about God's and Christ's bride collectively. He has saved us, yes, but he's also saved the church and we are to pull together as a church and uh, complete the building of Christ and be that temple. So often we lean on one person to, to do that. Oh, we're just going to come and listen to a sermon. We'll be taught, and then we're going to go, and that's our contribution. Oh, yeah, well, I, I give money, or I give my you know time doing X, Y, or Z, and that's wonderful. But we also need to testify to each other and to people who have not been as far in life as we have, how God is good and how he is uh, leading us. All of this comes to say that you can't teach what you don't have. Um, maybe you handed the child the trigonometry book because you don't understand trigonometry and you're hoping that they'll figure it out because you don't know really what's going on. Um, we need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. We need to know what it means, not simply, oh, okay, so I believe these set of facts, and if I believe these facts, then I'm good, and I should tell other people these facts. That's not the way that faith works. Um, that might be the way that mathematics works, where you can state this is the process, and here's your result. That's not how faith works. We have a very organic, I guess you could say, approach. Back in Deuteronomy 11, again, it wasn't here's the program's times when you do this. It is when you're walking, if you happen to be sitting, you know, if you're lying down, if you're rising up, just any old time, you should probably be teaching the faith. As far as the grandparents are concerned, as we said, being that anchor in the family, knowing what God has done for you, how he has carried you through your life, and being able to support your children as they raise their children and uh, learning about the Lord. What, what are we teaching, though? What, what are we passing down? Are we telling people, okay, you need to be a good person, um, you know, don't kill anybody, commit it all free, you know, try to not swear too much. I was going to see if anyone chuckled with that, but okay. No, don't, uh, you know, don't do these things and you'll be good. That's not, I mean, those are good things not to do, but that's not really what's going to save you at the end of the day. The question is, do you know the gospel? And you have to say, well, what is the gospel? And gospel was good news that it's not up to you to save yourself. It's not because you were so good and that your good outweighs your bad. You know, you think like cartoons. That's how, you know, you go there and, oh, your good outweighs your bad. You get into heaven. That's not the way it works at all. Because the truth is, is that it's all bad. Even the good things you try to do, still tainted with badness. Um, 
It says, the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. If you are, you know, uh, it doesn't matter your background. If you're the Jewish nation at that time, if you're a Gentile, as most people in here probably are, whether you are rich, whether you're poor, whatever your racial background, how many good works you do, it honestly doesn't count at all, and you are not worth going to God's kingdom. That's the bad news. Sometimes we have to start with the bad news. Um, because if you give good news with no context, it, eh, why is it so good? Yeah, the bad news is, apart from Christ, we are all headed to hell, away from God, um, punished for our rebellion against him, for raising our fist against him, for turning our back on him. So that's the bad news. And lovely little children that are so cute are also sinners. Everyone who has had children knows this. It is the by default nature that is what we do. Okay, that is that is what we do. It's, it's like falling off a log easy to be a sinner. Um, so what do we do with this? Children, young children, need to understand not beating them up or anything that we're all sinners. That we need a savior. That God's standard is perfection, complete compliance with His law. And there's been no one that has fulfilled that except Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a sinless life. He never uh, broke his fellowship with the Lord, with God, his Father, at any time in his life. Was able to follow the law for us on our behalf. And despite this, what did he get for this obedience? But he was... It says in Isaiah, he was despised and rejected by men. And as one from whom men turn away their faces, he was rejected. So we, as, a, as humanity, rejected Christ. And he was sentenced to die, a sinless man, through the lies of jealous religious leaders, essentially. He was crucified and killed the Son of God who deserved not to die. He died on our behalf. And the thing is, God knew this from the beginning. It wasn't a last-minute band-aid to fix where things went wrong. Christ, from the beginning, was going to redeem his people. He was going to come and rescue his bride, the church. He knew when he came to earth that he was going to be the perfect lamb sacrifice. And being sacrificed, you think the story would end there. Now, you guys probably obviously know it doesn't, a lot of you. But the amazing thing that I think we miss because we're so familiar with it is he was resurrected. He came back from the dead. And if you think about how stunning that is, and if you think about if you actually believe that, how crazy that seems to people who do not know God, just marinate in that in a second. Believe that, you know, okay, there's these religions. People make them up to kind of get by in life. There's different ones. They're all about equal. Um, maybe there's some kind of spiritual world. I don't know if I believe it. And then you have people saying there was a physical man who died, and then he was alive again. And then he ascended into heaven. Um, and then he said that we, too, could come alive again and ascend into heaven. You would think, you know, what in the world are they talking about? Because it is an extraordinary claim, but it's also true. And having that simple childlike faith in the truth of the gospel is what will save you. Not all of your good works, not all the money you gave, not everything you avoided doing, but the faith in God's provision for your salvation is what will save you. And the amazing thing is not only will he save you, but while you're still here on earth... He will send His Holy Spirit to dwell in you and to guide you and to teach you and to help you along the way as you stumble, that you can be forgiven of any of your sins. This is what we have to testify to our children and to our children's children. This is the faith that we have that we must understand. We don't need to overcomplicate it, but we also need to dwell on it and contemplate it and think of it deeply as we 
tell our families, as we tell our neighbors, as we tell anyone we come into contact with. So my challenge to you this morning is whatever context of life you are in, whether you have young children, older children, adult children, grandchildren, no children, the important thing is for you to know the gospel, to believe in Christ, to accept his sacrifice on your behalf, that you may be raised with him, that you will be joined to the kingdom of God, and that you will spread that in whatever context that is. That God will empower you and give you the words to say, to teach those of your family and those of your community the way to follow Christ and the way to become part of his kingdom. Um, I appreciate everyone listening today to this and considering it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm not typically preaching, so I am filling in for Pastor Chris, um, he, who should be back next week. However, if anything that I've said today has stirred your heart, we are going to have an invitation on the altar. We'll be open. And I just appreciate everyone being here and hearing the word. If you join, uh, join us in song here in just a moment, and I'll close this in prayer. Again, thank you so much. One quick announcement. John Fox wanted me to mention that next Saturday, there's the Back to School Bash. They're going to be meeting here at 930. 
However, please talk to her today if possible or call her this week. Try to line up volunteers need about double what she has currently. So if you are able to next Saturday morning, 930, be here for Back to School Bash, please talk to John Fox. We are going to have a meeting here in just a few minutes. We are going to take a break for a few minutes, let people get their children, uh, get nursery workers up here so they can be part of that meeting. Uh, this would be a good time to you know, step to the restroom or do whatever you need to do to get ready for that. So if you're able to stay, that would be wonderful. Um, Non-members are welcome to stay. Uh, only members can vote in that, though. And if you'll join me in prayer, thank you. Father, thank you for your word. Um, thank you for bringing the the truth of Christ to us through the generations, for faithfully being by the church, guarding her through persecution, um, guarding her through apostasy and through uh, teaching that is contrary to your will. Thank you for watching over her and protecting her. And I pray that you'll continue to watch over the church into the future, Lord, until the return of Christ. And help us as we here in our local congregation um, strive to be uh, share the light of the gospel in this community that you would be with us as well. This in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.